and welcome to tonight's episode of PCP, the Bacon Center Podcast. I'm Dave. I'm Amber. You're up next, Sam. I'm Sam. I'm Scarf. Also joining us tonight is our guest of the night, Emily Carlin, when we're going to be discussing tonight Defense of the Darkness, uh, her latest book. And we'll get into discussion about that right after these messages. You're listening to the Pagan Centered Podcast, bringing unique and intelligent perspective to the masses using contemporary technology, allowing for free discussion of one's personal beliefs and enlightenment of those not familiar with a particular religion. We bring to the forefront many issues that are ignored or shunned upon by mainstream religion. We discuss topics on a religious and non-religious level as they relate to our panel representing varied belief systems. Our brute honesty and candid opinion has made us one of the longest-running and most popular pagan podcasts. Feel welcome to call in live or submit listener feedback via our website, PaganCenteredPodcast.com. And we're back. Yay, post-production. So... So, so why don't we just kind of go out, go around and uh, kind of share our thoughts of what we thought the, you know, the book was about. And our opinions and thoughts and feelings and whatever about it. Don't everybody go at once. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know you all read it. Yes. I'm actually, like, browsing through going, man, that's my thoughts. <laughs> um, I think it's a very, um, if I got my thoughts in a line before I actually spoke, that would be awesome. <laughs> I think it's a really good book for somebody who's starting out. Uh, As with anything, I think all of us are going to have um, disagreements here and there where we go, I don't know. One thing I was curious about, you have the rating system, Mm -hmm. but you never had anything marked on a low level of common and easy. Um, Imps and Pixies? No. Mm -hmm. Those are... If I remember yeah, I right, no. Do, do, do. Gotta find them. Because yeah. I think, um, like, residual ghosts are, like, a one. Yeah, because there's still a rarity of four. So it was like, there's nothing a rarity of no. There might not be anything. Imp is a lo- uh, rarity of two. Difficulty removal, one to two. Most of the stuff just isn't that common. Like, the, yeah, it depends on who you are, though. I mean, that's very true. I I did this on a scale of average people. When you get into medical practitioners, the whole bell curve gets skewed. <laughs> you know, we all have that lovely bell curve where when we mm-hmm. know just enough to get ourselves in trouble and things happen every other day. That's a totally different thing. I love my schizophrenic walk. Hmm. Yeah, I've got it too. But I would, I would think that most people that are, and this is just my opinion, most people that are going to pick up your book mm-hmm. are not going to be people who don't have anything to say about it. They're usually going to pick up a book like this because things are happening. So I would have thought to, to have the bell curve more towards somebody who would be already looking. Because mm-hmm. the people that are dead to it, well, they're going to be dead to it anyway, and I don't think anything <laughs> in the book is going to make a difference to them. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I do. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, it, it wasn't the way I went, but yeah, I completely understand it. Anybody else can pick up well, after I, this? I, I, think it's kinda, I think the first thing we should do is kind of explain a book to our listeners that are not completely lost. <laughs> no. Let's, 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 let's I was wondering why we're doing it backwards. <laughs> let's let's go with the not confusing people thing first. Okay. So, so this is a book that's, as far as I, I remembering it, is broken down into two parts. Uh, you got the part one, which is kind of a, a good reference guide 
for the um, uh, various uh, entities that are out there. So you can get a background of the lore and uh, just general things that, you know, metaphysically you would want to be aware of with these entities. Uh, especially, you know, what kind of trouble they can cause. Are they good? Are they known to be generally, you know, not so good? Uh, is it easy or difficult to remove them? Are there any particularly uh, specific, uh, um, you know, means of removing those particular entities and so forth? And then the second half of the book, not a little less than half, but the second part of the book is about, you know, the metaphysics of it all, you know. Uh, just general metaphysics as to generally removing uh, entities, uh, witch bottles, and you know, war water, and so on and so forth. You know, general cool things to know. Um, a little beyond your metaphysics 101, but it's still very much uh, something I think a, a person that's new to metaphysics and at least comfortable at the point where they're comfortable with doing things can uh, get most of the stuff. Um, and then, uh, obviously, the stuff that's not quite uh, for one-on-one material is clearly labeled as such. Um, but it's not stuff that's aloof or going to go fly over your head. Uh, and I think that's, you know, the first half is more or less a reference guide. You can read through it if you want to get a brush up on lore that, you know, if you go into a pagan festival or something, you know, brush up on lore that most people will expect you to be somewhat familiar with. Um, but other than that, you can just use it as a reference guide. Is that pretty much what everybody else took away from it, or, or different thoughts, opinions, stuff I overlooked? No, I think you had it pretty good. Yeah. I don't think you really overlooked anything. I, I will say that there was a lot of... I was impressed with the amount of research on a lot of it. So instead of it being just a quick giving one simple... You know, Banshees are in Ireland, yay! You actually went into a lot of the stories and more than I've seen in a lot. So that was that was nice. Thank you. Uh, this this book was definitely a labor of love, um, and you know, I'm one of those people that when I first got into magic, I uh, really wanted things to happen, and so I kind of did some really stupid things, like saying, "Hey." Show me stuff. I don't care what it is. And and so, you know, the gods did. <laughs> and at the time, there was really... I didn't have access to other people that knew what they were doing. And so I was completely lost. And my friends were completely lost. And we had to figure things out absolutely piecemeal. And this is a book that I wish I had had when I was, you know, 19... Yeah, this is definitely, yeah, this this is definitely, definitely one of those uh, missing... Water, uh, uh, Sam, you're echoing. Uh, this is definitely one of those uh, missing, uh, I guess you would say, pieces of the puzzle, per se, for what should be in everyone's 101 kit. Yeah. I can actually say that I'm going to pass this on to my little sister after the episode. <laughs> so. Speaking of... Yes, sports to the way we had. Okay. Sam, any thoughts from you? She's stuck on mute. Uh, no, I'm not stuck on mute. You said I was echoing. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Am I, am, is it over with? As long as nope. I don't talk. I don't talk. <laughs> well, then well, shut this up. This one's going to be fun if I was this. No, I, um, my take on your book, I really enjoyed it. Um, I like... When things are hap- when I need to look up information that there's a concise, condensed beginning to something that I can kind of get the cliff notes, and then if I need to get into more, you know, into more detail, I can. So I really enjoyed your rating system. Um, it, it almost read to me almost like Cunningham's uh, Herbal Encyclopedia, where everything was broken down really nice, and then if I needed to get into more information on something, or if I narrowed it down to whatever was going on into a specific group. There was research, and also your bibliography was wonderful. Um, it definitely is a great starting point for doing research. Um, and it, it kind of helps you to get an idea of, of where to start from instead of just, you know, typing into Google and getting flooded with a thousand things and really not knowing where to go, um, especially 
I can see it's helping people out when they're when they're starting metaphysics and before they they get a a base of their own knowledge or or kind of know what's going on in their backyard. Um, so I I really enjoyed it, and you know, like like Amber said, it, you know, I I really would have liked it when I was starting out in my metaphysical work because I was a lot like you. I had absolutely no access. I didn't have the internet. You know, I couldn't go to the library and get stuff, so I was really in the dark. And uh, I wish I had one book that I could have gone to and at least gotten a feel of what was going on. Yeah, well, I, I teach at an online school called the Gray School, and most of my students are beginners. And so I spend a lot of time answering those panicked emails of, oh, my God, my friend had this thing happen. It was so scary. What do I do? I'm like, chill out. You're going to be fine. Read this. And then I don't have to answer the same question over and over again. It's kind of handy. Oh, so it's your FAQ. Uh-huh. Anything that the average person is going to experience is probably in the book or some variation. That certainly not exhaustive. There is I never limit to get themselves into. I mean, there could be new and novel, horrible things happening at any given time. But for the most part, I think this covers probably 90% of what people might actually run into and more. There's certainly things in there that I don't think anyone will ever run into, but I get questions about them, so I put them in there. I know this is supposed to be longer than 10 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just burnt out today. Just from an artistic point of view, ah, typography. Okay, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I, I, I. What, Scurvy? Or no continue? Over what the publisher does with the fonts and things. I have to ask, though, why did you name the title like that exactly? I didn't. The publisher said, Defense Against the Dark. And I said, okay. <laughs> uh, I think my original title was A Witch's Field Guide to Things That Go Bump to the, in the Night and How to Bump Back. Um, cute. But I think they, they liked the kind of Harry Potter searchness of Defense Against the Dark. Yeah, because I'll have to say every time I look at it, I'm like, Defense Against the Dark Arts. And that's all I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Well, that was. I actually took it to work today to uh, do some last minute cramming. No comments, please. <laughs> and that was. I love you too. That was a bit of a showstopper. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not subtle. Um. But but the artwork is really pretty. <laughs> yeah, uh, I like the artwork on the inside. Yeah, yeah, the uh, ink washes are nice. Yeah, they're not overly. They don't I take away from the text. They're just an ad- addition. I was so terrified I was going to get like comic book dripping gore with half naked women. So many books like this get those kinds of illustrations, and and I was very very happy <laughs> that the illustrator was. Tasteful. Once again, I had no control over it, but I, I ended up really liking them. Wow. Barrett yeah, Allen updated his photo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, Barrett. Sorry about that ADD moment. That's like fire. <laughs> <laughs> it was an excellent day. Well, that's good. We're just discur- we're discussing defense against the darkness at the moment. Neat. So, um, Emily, if was it hard to to put all this energy and effort into writing a book and then deliver it off to these strangers who were going to manipulate it and and dress it up? Like, did you struggle with with the process of being a writer and and not actually being able to? have the funds to independently put your book out? Um, 
never really imagined, like, I never considered self publishing. Um, I have some friends that have written metaphysical books. So I knew that I had ins for all the publishers, and that way I could actually, you know, make money and have a publicist and do all that kind of thing. Um, but there was a, a bone marrow drenching terror that they would take what I had done and make it sparkly. And uh, I, I was very pleased <laughs> that it didn't come back looking um, like so a Ravenwolf's book. So they took it seriously enough that I was, was really quite happy, and they've been really good to me. So there was definitely some terror um, as a writer, but I know enough writers that I knew what the process was going to be, and I knew that this particular publisher was pretty respectful, so I wasn't that concerned. Is there anything that you would have changed now that you see the final product? Um, I don't know. You know, on the one hand, I'm pretty happy with, you know, my part of it. Um, the title isn't bad in terms of selling books. Um, I think the only thing I would really change is I would add the questions that I get most often these days are the, well, yeah, that's what you do if it's something normal, but whatever I'm experiencing couldn't possibly be that easy to deal with. And so what do you do when none of that works? And my knee-jerk reaction is, well, have you tried? <laughs> but I think I probably would have done a little bit more of addressing kind of try these things first, then worry about what happens if they don't work. Because a lot of people are just really freaked out by these things, and that's who I wrote it for. You know, my whole idea was when people don't understand what's going on, they get really freaked out by things that are not actually dangerous and that are not actually bad and that if they had enough information to feel like they had some control over the situation, then they wouldn't have to be scared anymore. So, I think I did what I set out to do. Um, there's, there's lots of little things that I would tweak and like two or three typos that I found in the book that makes me so sad. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Hmm. Do you have any plans on making a, a second part or um, a, a more, like a, a, a part two or an advanced part? Or Yeah. Uh, right now, I've started writing my second book, which is um, definitely more of an advanced practitioner's guide. Um, the second book so far still in the very proto stages. I've written like a chapter. It's going to be case studies where you have kind of scenarios where it's worst case scenarios when everything goes wrong and kind of all the different things you can try and really, instead of taking the assumption that whoever's going to read it really doesn't know anything. I'm just going to assume that everybody's got their own practice. Everybody's got their favorite methods. And what they really need is a, a book of inspiration that they're going to then adapt to their own suit and their own personal style. So that's what I'm trying to do now. Do you find it harder or easier being... You know, the first one, everything, uh, the only thing I can think to say is, you know, dumbing it down for people who just don't know any better. Is it, was it easier to do it that way and do the very basics, or is it easier for you writing this new one, just assuming people know things and going from there? Um, both, I guess. I mean, on the one hand, writing beginner stuff is easy in that you don't have to worry too much about all the what-ifs. It's just, this is the basics. If you want to know more, go find a book that's entirely dedicated to this one thing. Um, of course, on the other hand, it means that you have to assume they know nothing and you have to explain every little step, which is 
tricky. The thing that I'm really enjoying about the advanced one is that it's a challenge for me to actually come up with a lot of it. Like, for example, I just wrote a, a chapter on advanced shielding um, based on a scenario where I actually I have a friend who volunteered with the Red Cross and went to Tunisia for a humanitarian mission and before she left she asked my advice on how do I shield in a refugee camp it's like wow that's not something that comes up every day and that requires more shielding than I think I've ever had to use in my life uh, so just coming up with all the different kind of options for someone who's doing that kind of thing is really fun um, on the other hand because I'm trying as much as possible to write for kind of a non-traditionalist position where it's not any one type of magic as someone who is of you know a kind of witchcraft background it's hard to write things that i know will also appeal to people that practice completely different kinds of magic and not to just have everything i do come through as just being kind of oh look that's witchcraft and oh look that's kind of wicked oh look that's that and hmm wouldn't it be great if you talked about the things that i actually do so that bit is definitely more of a challenge, but it's a really fun challenge, because it forces me to kind of expand out of my own box. And that's awesome. We were just talking a little bit beforehand where, you know, knee-jerk reactions to initially write it in the book, and some of us are like, Rawr! but then looking at it, we're so used to dealing with these things that it's hard to take a step back and go, Okay, imagine if we were somebody who doesn't know anything about this and looking at it from this perspective. And there's a lot of things that you can really appreciate when it's like that because there's, you know, don't touch it. I'm not very <laughs> don't good go at in that. And, I know you're not very good at that, Scurvy. That's why we give you this book, so, <laughs> so we don't have to tell you. I love you too. <laughs> But there's there's enough of them where it's like, you know, sometimes you don't have to do anything. You can just let it go its way and it will be fine. And other ones where it gives you examples and other ones where it just says, don't touch it. <laughs> and I think a lot of books seem to be afraid of the don't touch it stamp. <laughs> Yeah. And as much as I can look at it and go, yeah, but I can do something, it, going back and, and saying, somebody who is beginning, like if I'm giving this to my little sister, there's enough of them that I will say, don't touch it. Wait till I get there, don't look at it, don't go near it, don't smell it. So looking at it from that standpoint, it's it was much easier to digest it. And I'm really curious to see the new one you put out then. Because that's just exciting. Well, I w would certainly love your guys' input on that kind of um, You may get emails from me with proofs. Um, Excellent. No problem. We're, we're really good at judging other people. <laughs> hey. We are I mean, really good at constructive criticism. criticism. <laughs> I was. One thing I. Couldn't help but notice enough for the uh, layout for when it's listing the uh, lore in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It looked a lot like something out of a and d book. You know, I actually just got that from an interview I did yesterday. Um, I did not play D&D &D as a kid. Um, so, yeah, I've seen monster manuals, um, but that was definitely not my intention. Um, I can totally see it now that it's been pointed out to me. Um, and I don't see that as a bad thing, because my idea for having, like, the, the numbers and the quick guide at the beginning was, if someone doesn't know what they're dealing with, they can read that little section really quickly, see if it matches at all what they're experiencing, and decide on how much they need to panic, basically. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely not my intention, and it wasn't my inspiration. Uh, it... it really does look like one, though. I enjoyed the amount of time that you took on discussing 
precisely why sometimes it's not advantageous to try to do anything and also why it's not advantageous to get yourself in over your head unintentionally. Um, my biggest fear when I got the book was I thought to myself, great, here's somebody who's thinking that they're going to write down stuff and teach you how to get rid of all these, you know, oogie boogies and they're not going to caution people enough. Um, one of the things I always worry about, especially new people trying to get their hands dirty is first of all, they're over enthusiastic enthusiasm to to have a great story to tell their friends and the other thing is that when you start poking at things and showing um, that you have proficiency in poking at things it tends to attract um, even bigger and badder things and it can just compound itself exponentially um, so I was really pleased when I read this I kind of went in thinking I wasn't going to like it and I was like oh wow you know she's doing her research um, and that was great. Did you have people that you collaborated with that were of different faiths to kind of help you not put too much of your own tradition in there or? No, actually. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I teach at the Gray School, which is an online, non-religious, non-denominational school. So I've got a certain amount of practice in writing things that aren't quite as from my own tradition. Um, and like I said, I have a lot of students that are very much beginners. Some of them are youth students. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very... I'm almost over-cautious with people getting in over their heads because I've been there. I've been the dumb kid experimenting with things and had them go wrong and gotten way in over my head and had to, you know, dog paddle my way out of it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was definitely something I was concerned about. Um, I did collaborate with a lot of people in terms of, I talked to a lot of people about their experiences when I was writing it. Um, you know, the grade school is huge. We have hundreds of students from all over the world and I've been able to, get stories and, you know, email communications and met a lot of these people, and they're from every tradition, every faith, all kinds of different backgrounds, and it's been great practice on kind of not being a prat, <laughs> you know, talking to people that are completely different all the time, so I'm glad that I seem to have succeeded. Yeah, but only by our standards, so <laughs> it doesn't... No one listens to us, so it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Don't say otherwise. You'll hurt our defense mechanism. <laughs> yeah. I've been... Kind of, a lot of the people that have been contacting me as a result of the book have been people that do ghost hunting. Because, of course, that is the big thing nowadays. Um I think before we started recording, you guys were talking about the new paranormal shows. That has really inspired a lot of people to do stupid things and then email me going, ah! And it hadn't actually been in my brain when I wrote it that those would be the people that would be reading it at all. And apparently they really are. If that's the case, I want you to write a book solely dedicated as to why you should not use Ouija boards. Oh, oh my, my god. Because yeah. <laughs> those are the jerks that need to friggin' read it, you know? I think all of us pagans, we get a little into things and we realize how stupid it is to blanketly invite stuff into our houses. Um, yeah. But it's the well-meaning ghost hunters that, you know, they want to believe and have watched X-Files all their lives um, that screw it all up. So if they're the ones reading your books, just a whole book on that. It'd be awesome. Yeah, I have several blog posts on how not to be, you know, really, really stupid while doing a ghost hunt. You know, I've had people ask, like, well, I don't want to do protections before I go into a haunted house because it might lessen my experiences. And on the one hand, you know, I completely understand that. And i first one to run headlong into a situation to see what happens. Um, but on the other hand... And if you know that a place is supposed to have, like, five demons that push people down the stairs, 
maybe you should take some kind of precaution before you go in there. Maybe. That's just me. I like good practical advice. My, my, uh, my biggest thing and, uh, is that you, you don't crap where you eat. Yeah. So, so, like, don't do stuff in your house. Like, you know, like, I keep my house very heavily warded. You know, like, this is the one place I could just be like, oh, finally, you know, and not have to worry. Um, and then people bring Ouija, you know, like my stepson, he's like, oh, oh, we should get a Ouija board, and we should do this. And I'm like, no, no, we're not, because I, I put energy into making this house safe, and you're going to screw it up. So I'm cool with people, like, you know, playing with EVPs and stuff outside of their house. But, you know, just, you know, clean your shoes off before you come into mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think that um, what you were talking about with running into a situation and, you know, I think all of us have, have gone poking at things when most people go, what are you doing? You shouldn't poke at that. Yeah, but I got a stick. <laughs> they need to poke at. Yep. yep. But the the experience of being able to to tell... Yes, we will go at poking things, but we will do so in a manner where we will do this, this, and this first. And if we do not, we are prepared for this, this, and this. And you know, if when you have experience, you have that those stories to tell on why or what mistakes were made. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the the personal stories rather than just being just saying, well, don't touch it. Well, why? Well, because I was told not to touch it, and you're just not supposed to. Mm-hmm. Right, like I'd listen to that. Exactly. You know, saying, well, you don't want to touch this. Well, why? Well, because when you touch it, this happens, and then this happens, and then even if you shield, then this happens, and it just blows up and makes it worse, and they go, oh. And it causes a lot more thinking, and it's not simply a... It shows that it's more complicated than just, they can't hurt me, I'm just going to poke at it and run. Yeah. And I think that This isn't a reiki approach to things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dave, how, like, eventually, if a forum conversation goes long enough, it goes to Hitler? Yeah. Yeah. I found that if our podcast goes long enough, it goes to Reiki. <laughs> <laughs> this show goes to Reiki. This show goes this is true. I propose we make a vi- I propose we make a card game where you have all the Godwin Trumps. So we'll need Hitler and slavery and not Reiki too. Well, we never rolled thirty four yet. Now I think that's a good thing. Ooh. Yeah, let's keep it that way. <laughs> Sorry, we got a kid in the background. I'm on a headset. It's all right. <laughs> so, Emily, we've kind of alluded to what. What are your personal, like your tradition? Not to sound too much like a pickup line. <laughs> <laughs> What's my sign? <laughs> uh, I consider myself to be a witch. Um, like many, many people, I kind of started off with Wicca and Dobo the Leaper and kind of did my own thing. I'm very eclectic. Um, I come from a multicultural household, so I'm very, very used to sitting around swimming in a bunch of different traditions that don't necessarily go together and yet somehow making it work. That's my comfort zone is, you know, I like the chocolate vanilla swirl ice cream and I like it in my magic too um i'm the kind of person where i was a goth in high school i was a goth in college not exactly a bright shiny person um so when i got into magic i got into some of the darker bits (laughs) and you know things came out of the walls and tried to eat me and then i decided that was very stupid and i should protect myself and i got very good um, so that's kind of why I do what I do now. Um, I just find it very, very interesting, and yeah, I always like learning about new traditions too because there's always fun and tasty things to steal and incorporate into my own practice. And 
I just think it's more interesting that way. And it makes it even better when you, you've experienced things in your tradition and then you start looking at another tradition and they may not have the same wording, but you start to notice the same patterns and same examples. It's a, a wonderful confirmation of something that you've experienced. And I like when I find those patterns because to mm -hmm. me that's more validation well, that it works better, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it shows in my approach to the book, too, where instead of talking about, you know, you know, the specific instances of, like, in Japan, they have a ghost that does this, that is called this, and in Russia, they have a vampire that does this, that is called this, and instead I just talk about kind of broad categories, and all those other guys kind of go underneath them. Because in my research, I found so many of the same stories coming up over and over again in slightly different iterations from different cultures and different backgrounds, but really, really similar stories. I, I don't think I found a single culture that didn't have shapeshifters, vampires, and ghosts. They were in all of them in one form or another. And so instead of talking about all the little tiny bits, I talked about the big bits um, that are the, the commonalities. And I think when it comes down to it, that'll make it easier because it, going off of not making it any kind of denomination, people can claim bits for their own and do their own bit of research with parts that they feel more comfortable with or, or so on and so forth. But it also um, gives the opportunity for people to realize that things may not be confined to A, B, or C that it, you know, somebody calling it one thing could be the same thing and how to handle it is very similar even though they approach it differently. And I think that's... it. Words into a sentence, that would be awesome. I have a... You know, a dictionary of mythological creatures because I thought it was cute. And when it comes down to it, it was actually kind of annoying in a way. Because you'd read one and then it would say, and then look at the century. And then you'd read another one and it would reference the century. And then you'd read another one and it would reference the century. Or be like, well, it's a this type of creature from this type of area. And instead, it's... It's more like when you're bored and you want to learn random bits of fact. It's like hitting than... random on Wikipedia. Yes! <laughs> yes! And they have a lot of cool information, but yours is more to be utilized. Well, thank you. That was the point. Um, no, I, I love those books. Like, I have dozens of the books and they're great when you're like waiting for somebody you can just flip through random pages and learn oh isn't that interesting just like hitting random on wikipedia you can learn about you know the kensington footballer club um, <laughs> which you wouldn't otherwise and it's cool but it's not necessarily the most useful of information um i wanted to make something that anybody could you know pick it up glance at the information and then figure out what to do very, very quickly. And I just wanted more useful information because I always wanted to find a book that would say, okay, if you're experiencing something like this, do this and it will go away. And I just never found that book. Um, so I wrote it. So That's do you plan on... <laughs> Well, I'm sure if she made it more complicated, most people wouldn't understand it, though. Uh, and she'd be missing her target audience. I do like having the book, you know, I like people to read it instead of just look at it. So, <laughs> did try for relatively simple. So, do you plan on using the same style of writing when you do your advanced books, or are you taking a different approach to it? Um, well, it's definitely going to be a very... Well, okay. 
I'm going to take the same non-specific, multi-traditional approach, because I think it works better. Um, and I think it's more useful for more people that way. I'm definitely doing that. Um, the advanced book is not going to be any kind of creature guide at all, so it's going to be very, very different. Um, the basic layout that I've that I'm using so far, having written you know one section of it, is to have a case study that is basically a story in which things happen, um, and shows a bunch of different demonstrations and. You know, things where you can actually get inside the person's head who's doing it, and you can write the things like, well, when you cast this kind of shield, it feels kind of like you're wearing a big suit made out of jello. <laughs> Which some shields feel like, and you don't really get in a lot of books that talk about feeling, about how it feels to have them up, and what it what it feels like when your strength begins to flag and you know you have to take down certain kinds of shields. Um, and after that, I'll have an analysis section, which will go over kind of the, the nuts and bolts of what's done, why it works, what doesn't work, um, and things that don't really fit into the narrative. So I think it will just be a different approach that might be a little bit more interesting to read. I'll be sure to wear my jello armor on the way to the 7-Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dave. I'm supposed to be the immature one. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just imagining Dave walking, and every time, even though he's wearing tennis <laughs> on pavement, going squish, squish, squish. <laughs> hey, hey, it goes back to our analogy of people that that do like heavy shielding, and then they do it for no good reason, and then they wind up at the Seven Eleven for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. When I was younger, I was obsessed with shielding, like absolutely, totally obsessed, and I have no clue why. And I definitely was one of those people that shielded for no reason at all. Um, the only good thing I could say is now I subconsciously do it, so kind of makes my life easier. But it definitely made me like be somewhat of a space cadet for most of junior high into high school. Crazy. I get a lot of students asking me about... You know, oh, can I have shields that are, like, made out of shards of broken glass? It's like, um, theoretically, it's a really bad idea. Why, why would you want to do that? Um, you know, chill out. You're probably not actually being hexed by that kid down the street that doesn't like you. Uh, that doesn't actually happen that often. You know, one shield that just filters out negativity but doesn't block all sensations from coming to you so you're not walking around in a fog all day will do you in most situations. You know, not that I wasn't I think, a parent the, or shielder when I started out. So I certainly was. Though I think another way that your book approaches things differently is I didn't get the feeling of Chicken Little whenever I was reading it and there's a lot of them where it's like and if the lights flicker it's a demon you, you know if the door moves they don't even say you know oh well it's it's still kind of rare all they do is oh my god the sky is falling hurry fix it and shield and cast things and throw things at it and turn around three times and stand on your head but it's yours takes a very responsible and reasonable approach, and that's something where in a lot of how to defend against things, I'm not quite seeing a lot of yet. Yeah, it's definitely true, and I definitely kept that in mind when I was reading it. You know, like I said, I have students that are kids that are freaked out, and I spend a lot of time talking them down. And a lot of people email me saying, oh, this is happening. I must be cursed. Um, no. Chill out. <laughs> You're actually okay. Um, you know, I think it's really... The books that tell you that everything that is happening is horrible... 
remind me of the people that tell you you're cursed and then charge you five hundred dollars to remove the quote unquote curse. <laughs> Like, you must buy my book or else you will never be safe! No. Actually. <laughs> All that book will do is make you insane for a week until you forget it. Um, no, the, I'm really big on kind of putting out good PR for the magical community and particularly for people who specialize in the kind of things that I specialize we have a bit of a reputation of being the spooky, ooky, evil ones, and we're not necessarily. Sure, some of them are, but not necessarily, really. Just calm down. Oh well, yeah, maybe I, that's just. I, I think I think that that's all. Kind of what Amber was getting at. A lot of a lot of folks just you don't really see, you, you get the how to react, and you get the here's what's out there, but you don't get the here's how you assess the situation. Yeah. Magical triage. And that's the hardest bit. Anytime people ask me, well, how do I know that what's going on? Is it this or this or this or nothing? It's like, um, uh, Especially that's always so hard. Like <laughs> a yeah. can look like B, you know, in my book, I've got that index of symptoms down at the back. Yeah, which yeah, yeah. was the thing that I gave myself a gold star for. <laughs> Because that's the bit I wish I had had when I was, like, 19. Um, where you can kind of say, okay, if I... If, it's like when you look at, like, the diagnostics for, like, mental disorders, and if you have five of these ten symptoms, go see your doctor kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If you've got all... have one symptom that is common to eight other things, you don't know what you have. <laughs> And I've, I've yet to come up with a really good way to explain to you kind of the mundane how to know whether it's A, B, C, or nothing. Because for most magical people, you can kind of walk in and you know if it's nothing or if it's something. There's something about the feel, about the energies, that is usually fairly obvious. That something or nothing is going on. And... I had the hardest time trying to kind of get that across, and I, I don't know whether I actually succeeded. Mm. It's, always fun, it's always fun to translate to human experience. You know, I think that your, the, back, the, the back diagnostic session of your book was, was successful. Um, I think we all realize that there's never going to be a, a, a be-all, end-all, one resource kind of the Joy of Cooking-esque book for metaphysics. <laughs> um, which is perfectly okay. Um, but like I said, I think it's a really good starting point and I definitely agree with you that back when, when I was starting out and I knew absolutely nothing. Um if there was something that even came close to what you have accomplished, you know, and, and trying to just do a checklist of, you know, A, B, and C are occurring, you know, what the hell is this? Um, I probably wouldn't have freaked out as much as I did. And I think it, it came to, you know, having absolutely no finesse. And so every time something small happened, um, and perhaps something beneficial that just freaked me out because it was brand new, Um, I kind of killed it. Like, it was just, it, it, you know, when in doubt, cast it out, kind of, you know, ooh, something weird, and just, you know, kill it, kill it, kill it, you know? I did the exact same thing. <laughs> and it accomplishes nothing. I mean, you know, I doubt at age 12 when I'm, you know, trying to, you know, meditate so I can do it on a test that attracted anything close to what I thought it attracted, you know? Mm -hmm. Um... And maybe I just had a draft in my window. And here I am expending all of this energy for absolutely nothing. Um, and I also have to think, like, what, what did I miss out on? Like, maybe there is something beneficial. And I just creeped myself out. And good luck on anything ever coming back to help you, you know, after you do that. So I think, I think you did succeed. I think you, you know, definitely give yourself that gold star. <laughs> 
Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, going back on what I what I had said earlier, I think, you know, like. And I think her internet just went again. She <laughs> currently has clear weather down there. Clear weather and good internet for her do not mix. Now, if there was a hurricane down there, she'd be hosting the call. Hey, <coughs> she, she was doing great in Hurricane Oro. I know. <laughs> Maybe she's like a hurricane elemental or something and she just hasn't told us yet. No, nah, it's her. Nah, it's her it? Great, Dave. You have to take all the fun out of it. I think this episode's cursed. Just listen to the audio. Yeah. yeah. It's a little fuzzy. I've been on post producing this one, too. I, I post produced the last There's... four episodes, so somebody better be post producing this one. <laughs> okay. There'd be gremlins in our internets. So, Emily, when there's gremlins in your internet, what page should we refer to? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have cyber war water? <laughs> I, I think it's when you call on it, but, like, I forget which. <laughs> You sound really, really far away. The gremlins are eating her audio now. Oh, God. I haven't well, been kind of there. or anything, so... There she is. There she is. Is this better? Oh, don't worry. Some of her episodes are cursed. Yes. <laughs> Especially the ones that are supposed no, to be found... super fun. Mm. I found when I do radio interviews, if they're talking to me, they will get... Technical difficulties they've never had before. It's a weird thing. Oh, don't worry. We've oh, had all these it. difficulties before. It's good. Excellent. Oh. So it's not my weirdness. <laughs> nope. Yeah, you can even get notes on how to fix most of them once on uh, Audacity, too. Alrighty, did I drop off completely? No, you didn't, nope. Scarif. You just killed the conversation, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes! I that killed This is some that steam through the floor. Well, we're about 15 minutes into to. this train wreck. We might as well start wrapping things up. <laughs> What's Scarif? I could have said RV truck. All right, what, what order are we doing final thoughts in? We, we have orders for final thoughts? We have never had an order for final thoughts. <laughs> Today, I who's guess... got a thought and go with it? <laughs> I think that we should have a list for final thoughts, and that's my final thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I want to thank Emily for being on. I really enjoyed talking to you, dear. And I did enjoy your book, and I think it's going to help a lot of the younger generation. I think I'm old enough to say that now. Um, <laughs> Poor baby. I think it'll you be a, a really hug. good tool. No, I don't. I think it'll be a really good tool. Um, and I wish all the luck, and I can't wait for your second book. Thank you. My final thought is I'm really looking forward to that advanced book now. <laughs> so uh, I got something to look forward to uh, and for those of you that this is your first episode of PCP Scurry is not always that creepy old guy he just comes off as that way in this episode <laughs> from the bottom of my heart yep we love you Scurry nothing but love oh god I think my final thought is it's nice to see a different style of metaphysic book out there. I think it's a little overdue. And like everybody seems to be, I'm really anxious to see your advanced book and hope that uh, you'll come back on when it's out. No pressure or anything to publish this. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, we never tell people where to buy your book. 
Where can where can we buy your book? You can buy my book anywhere. You can get, get it on Amazon. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. You can get it at most local pagan shops at this point. It's called Defense Against the Dark. Um, you can always um, go to my website, which is www.e-carlin.com for information. It's got links to my blog. Um, I post all kinds of random stuff up there. Um, you can always email me with questions. Um, I actually really enjoy answering questions about totally random monsters. Um, it's just emily at e-carlin.com, so I'm really easy to get a hold of. And of course... If you want to learn from me, I teach at the Gray School, which is www.grayschool.com. Yeah. So oh, yeah, yes, listeners, to... go out, buy the book, buy five copies of it. Yes, Millions please. of them. Yes. <laughs> I know you gave us a digital copy or a free copy, but I liked it so much I actually bought myself a hard copy. So kudos oh. to you. Thank you. I've been looking for a book like this for like years. <laughs> that warms my heart. Ah, uh, no problem. Oh, and all of you listeners, even if you don't want the book, go to Amazon, search for the book "Defense Against the Dark," and click the little "I want to see this" button uh, on Kindle because it's in the endless queue for Kindle conversion. And the more people click that little link that I want to see this book on Kindle, the more likely it is to actually get up in the queue and get put on Kindle. Link so, bomb. Yeah. Yeah, Thank we're you not going to do our standard disclaimer of don't build any link clicking bots. Go ahead and build one. We don't care. <laughs> Dave, you know not to instigate our listeners. Yeah, especially when I know they'll actually do it. <laughs> These people make me look like I got good judgment. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt very much we can crash Amazon. Sure. Want to make a bet? But I just challenge. Let's see you try. <laughs> you know, 4chan does listen to this show, and they did take down Amazon once. A few <laughs> the entirety of 4chan, even B. Not all of 4chan. <laughs> <sighs> well, presumably. Lots of people from B. <laughs> I always wanted that to be my demographic. Well, I mean, look at our yeah, demo- yeah, yeah. We have weird demographics. <laughs> See, uh, where are we popular? We we we're popular in B. Twelve uh, step uh, programs. Twelve step programs. <laughs> um, deployed servicemen. So basically, any captive audience. <laughs> Wow, I feel so awesome now. You should. <laughs> PCP, number one in correctional facilities across the world. <laughs> of course the US. You have any you. idea what my inbox looks like since I started trying trying to find or plugging around for an interview for a uh, 12-step episode? Filter if Big Brothers watched me, they think I'm obviously addicted to everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about a cross between advertisements for cheap male enhancement products and a rehab per- and rehab flyers and stuff. <laughs> Is that final thoughts for everyone? Sky apparently had a final thought, and it was ding. <laughs> <laughs> what about Barrett? Barrett's been awfully quiet. Do you have a final thought over there? First of all, I'm usually awfully quiet. Second of all, I didn't really have a thought because I haven't had a chance yet to read the book. I will. Uh, that can be my final thought. My next book I buy is, is yours, Emily. <laughs> Yay, we sold something. Yay! My publisher will like that. <laughs> uh, it's going to sound strange, but for me, I love my lore and story form. Mm-hmm. It's it's just me. I mean, I know I'm weird. I like your pretty pictures. They remind me of scary stories by Charles Schultz, and that book still frightens me. Oh, I I can't read that book. I, started, I, I think I read that when I was like eight. It was very bad. 
Like the scariest stories for sleepovers? Scary no, stories for read the dark. Yeah, oh, like, I remember those. Those fucked with me as a kid. Yeah. <laughs> it is not so much the stories that are scary, it's the pictures that go with it because everything is bleeding. No matter what the man draws, <laughs> bleeding. Or rotting. Yes. <laughs> And I was really Christian back then, too, so that just completely <laughs> just just my mother scaring me all the time, and I was just like, ah. <laughs> well, that's it for this episode of PCP. If nobody else has anything else. Nothing. All right, all right that's it for this episode of PCP. Uh, the Pagan Center Podcast joins us again next week when, uh, hey, crap. When we talk about excessive legislation and marginalization, that's a scurvy episode. Scurvy. That's Ooh. still a work in progress. Yeah, it better be done next week. See ya. <laughs> Bye. 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 Right. I'm screwed. Recording I my flash. is uh, just about ended. Uh, recording is over. Well, that was fun. Yes, <laughs> even with the uh, audio gremlins. <laughs> yeah, Thanks normally it's not me. this. Hey, normally scurvy. it's not this bad. You need to stop by more often. That was entertaining. Scurvy, <laughs> I can you if I post something in the chat? Can you just? I want you to read it for me. I'm working on a project. I want to see if you'll be a good voice actor for it. God, okay. just just go for this one. Just just in your typical, <clears throat> just read it as as scurvy can only read stuff. Well, go on. You realize reading activates the wrong part of my brain to do this. Yeah. But okay. I just want you to sound like Eeyore. <laughs> and on that note, I think I'm going to go. I <laughs> see what I get to put up with. <laughs> It was great. Well, you have to put up with. Thanks for coming. Bye, Em. Bye. Bye. Later. So I'm just telling everybody we can look for the North Pole, or we can play Here We Go Gathering Nuts in May with the end of part of an ant's nest. It's all the same to me. See, you said that happier than you were the entire interview. <laughs> yeah, you did. And that's kind of perturbing to me, my dear. <laughs> Why? Because she was a very nice person, and you were just all like, yeah, I guess writing is a good I, thing if you're not an ape. I, <laughs> like, dear yeah. Lord. I always, I always, <laughs> I always womp in interviews, you know that. Not always, my dear. You were being particularly nasty. Amber really? has, yes, and Amber had to save you every time. Yeah. You you were being a bit of an ass there. I'm sorry. It's okay. But that's why you have to post produce this episode. Mwahaha. Yeah, this is gonna be fun. Have fun with the echo that Sam generates. Am I still doing it? Damn it. No, you're not. No. It's, <laughs> that's the funny no, part. No, as soon as the episode over is over, you're good. God that's damn it. You. Right. <laughs> that's <beautiful. sighs> <laughs> I might just pull a gut wrench and add in even more sound effects to make a sound deliberate. You know what? That's part of the reason why I struggle listening to an entire episode at once. Of ours or his? His. Ah, uh, his. It's very whiz bang pow, and it's kind of fun sometimes. It's not frozen. It's defrosting in the fridge. Baby! You're defrosting the baby in the fridge? <laughs> yeah, we defrost the baby in the fridge. He was frozen. We put him over ice. Now you can hear he's well again. <laughs> Hi, Alan! <laughs> Alan says you people are weird. I don't care. <laughs>
that your picture is a frog, Amber? That that reminded me of like those frogs that you can freeze and defrost and they'll live. And... <laughs> I don't know what it is. Every time you talk with an animal picture, I see the animal talking. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> My little frogs uh, talking to you. I was a poo poo head. I'm gonna have to apologize to her. You no, know, all that much of a poo poo head. It was just funny, and you sounded like Eeyore, and you lost your tail. <laughs> I want that to become a PCPism. What scurvy lost his tail? Yes. People might start getting the wrong idea and think he's he's a furry. Oh forgot about that stuff. (laughs) Obviously, I'm not on B enough. Although, see, Deke discovered B about a month ago. I am such a bad influence. (laughs) You are. And so he's on there. And, like, it just, it frightens me. It's such a scary thread. And, And it's just frightening. The shit that gets on there. And then... I try to figure out, like, nope. like where Dave has posted and where Scurve has posted and where and Rhea has posted, <laughs> and that makes it scarier. I can't post on there. Yeah, I've never posted anywhere in Fortran, actually. No? Okay. Well, that's good, I think. No, yeah, no, no. We're going to come um, to be good. If you post in 4chan now, as far as the army is concerned, you're a, men- you're a member of Anonymous and part of a terrorist group hell bent on taking over and uh, destroying our infrastructure. Wow. I better get posting. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I'm going to head off and help the shark. Okay. Oh, bye, lady. I miss you. I meant to baby for me. I will. Alrighty. Bye, guys! Bye. Bye. So, Sam, when are we going to announce your pregnancy? Um, where? On PCP? Yeah. Um. You want us just to wait till you have the kid and then be like, surprise, she's been <laughs> pregnant for the past nine months. <laughs> right. My mother keeps putting off telling my father. Like, first, my uncle died. And that, you know, I understand. And then she was supposed to tell him this past weekend, but they went to Vermont to see my aunt, so she didn't want to tell him while he wasn't, like, at home and could have a temper tantrum there, I guess. Yeah. And, um... So, I, I don't know. Probably, I don't know. I'd probably give him, um the end of the week and then I'm just because I like I put it on Facebook but I blocked my family members Ah. and I'm just I just don't want my family to find out you know via a podcast or Facebook status and Barrett I have to say that is an awesome pick Uh, the pick yeah it was just after a a very fun time shooting and burning Bibles (coughs) nice (laughs) I got a little too excited. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, I woke up at burning Bibles. Well, that's also you missed the shooting part. <clears throat> what were you, you shooting? Need, Bibles? We we might need a little bit of a, a little bit of audio for um um uh, some audio clips that are getting thrown together because um the one I'm doing we have uh how's it Dave saying and say and uh. Christianity getting a ring of endorsement from a resident Satanist. <laughs> and Amber right? and Ashley crack cackling. <laughs> so yeah, I was Was I really that much of an ass? No, oh, scurvy, chill. Chill. Yeah, I'm in nervous breakdown. If you were having a nervous breakdown, you wouldn't be together enough to say it. You want to bet? <laughs> you don't know Scurvy very well. He can have a nervous breakdown and have a coherent conversation with you, and you have no idea until five minutes later. Where he's, like, <laughs> crying about the chicks, and it's like, what? 
What, what's wrong with the chiclets? Ooh, that sounds good. I want them. <laughs> yeah, there's like for everything we say. No, there's no. I have to go food shopping, and right oh. now I have <laughs> I have peanut butter cookies and ramen and eggs. Like that's what I'm living off of until payday. So that does kind of sound like a pregnancy uh, meal. <laughs> No, but I did put some cranberry sauce on top of a cheeseburger. Oh. And it was really good. Yeah, that could be good. And I kept going, well, in the UK, they put fruit chutneys on their meat, so this is okay. <laughs> nom, nom, nom. <laughs> no. How to become a good cook. Make a vow to yourself that every day you will cook, and you will eat what you cook. You will learn quickly. <laughs> I um I was thinking like maybe I should like write down the food combinations I'm coming up with during my pregnancy and then perhaps I'll like hit on some gold and I can open a restaurant. <laughs> Make sure you try them after you're pregnant though. <laughs> yeah. That's a good idea. The hormones are right leveled off. It's a really good idea. <laughs> Hey, Ashley? Yeah? How many nervous breakdowns am I going on now since you've known me? Breakdown? I can't even tell because there's so many that I that you've had that I didn't even know about, so I can't tell if it's like a perpetual nervous breakdown or there's a break between each breakdown or what's going on. So it's kind of like World War One, World War Two, like... Yeah. <laughs> Breakdown. He's a mess in a dress, but that's why we love him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> difference between getting hit by a snowball and getting hit by an avalanche. I have, you know, I have more going for me on half power than most people do on full. Exactly. So yeah. Sad part is, is how true that is. <laughs> so the scary part is, is when I was enlisted, I was shit-faced drunk one night, and the air crew rathered me, shit face drunk, go out troubleshooting than the people who were on duty. So I were out, either I was really good or they were really bad. And what would make this story more awesome was be if I could actually remember it. <laughs> <laughs> My guess on that matter is probably bull. Bull. <sighs> No, I, I, I got my ass chewed for about five different ways. <laughs> so that, was, that was my handiwork, too. <sighs> God. Dear God, why is YouTube not working for me? I have a song for scurvy. Actually, this is your Wednesday reminder that there's a new... Red versus blue out. I have not been keeping up to date since I've been like obsessed with Lex for the last five minutes. Oh, see how long God, Lex. Just skip <laughs> season three. Skip it all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like miss red versus hair, Zev. I like red versus blue, but only like one or two episodes at a time. I thought they stopped making red versus blue. No, they're in season nine, man. I thought they did too. Yeah. I thought they did too, then I realized, oh, wait. They just kept going and forgot to tell people. <laughs> it's like, this is the end. This is the series finale. Season six. Hello? <laughs> there you go, Scurvy. I put a, a song on your Facebook for you. What is it? It's it's Tom Petty's breakdown. It's a really good song, and it, it's kind of jaunty. I don't know. It's it's one of my preferred going crazy songs. <laughs> hey Dave, did you make a pagan men at PSG? No, I did not. You said you might. You you said you were thinking about it, so I thought yeah, I'd ask. I was thinking about it, and then I became lazy, and then nothing happened. 
I didn't do a PPP. I didn't do a Pagan Man. I did. I got some range reviews though, so I, at least I did something. But yeah, we're we'll gonna. Uh, I already got. Oh yeah, that's uh, two weeks from today. Pagan Man. Yeah, I've gotten so so busy over the last like month and a half that I am literally um over a month overdue. On post producing that that first. Oh, that's thing. normal. Yeah, that's all right. Most post <laughs> most post production happens at the last minute anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, you saw our release our PCon episode. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't there something that pushed that to the back burner? What was that? Other episodes. <laughs> yeah, we it was, it was going crazy for a while there. And then this one, I actually started. Then there's like, we had to post produce something else. So like, okay, well, I'll pick that up. And then I just sort of think I forgot about this one. And then we did a couple others. And then later on, you're like, oh, Dave. Or you're like, oh, J- Scurve. By the way, when are you doing one at the What If You Kids Say They're Christian episode? Huh? I said, my Dropbox? <laughs> oh. I sent a folder labeled to do. <laughs> Well, you figure, you know, we've referenced it on, like, seven shows we've released now. So we might as well release it. <laughs> oh, God. Everybody's like, what the hell episode are they talking about? I'm sure there is some avid fan pulling their hair. I was like, did I miss an episode? Is there something wrong with my iTunes? And I bet you there's probably even one poor fellow out there that has even gone as far as reinstalling whatever they download the podcast with. Because error shows up every week. <laughs> That's why Bear shows up every week. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Bear's like, you know, man, I, I know they recorded this, but this could go live next week. This could be six months from now till we see it. <laughs> yeah. By the time by the time this episode is released, the thing will be on Kindle, and everybody will be looking for the button, and it's already there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, or, I... or even worse, what's a Kindle? <laughs> <laughs> You're hoping to head out. Sorry, I yawned. You know, I'm beginning to think something, taking something that Amber helped me brew into a highly volatile place of uh, work to uh, utilize to, um, yeah, it was a bad idea. You think? <laughs> I like the results, though. Wait, you took that shit to work? <laughs> yeah. What about that whole don't shit where you eat thing? Oh, I, I can't eat there. I, I puke every time I could eat there. Trust me, that place is so fucked up, you wouldn't believe it. Actually, it made my workspace habitable for me. What was the the brew meant for? What was its purpose? Uh, um, pretty it's- much, uh, it's a slightly tamed down version of uh, Cobbles Blood or something like that, um. No, I don't know what she did for you, but it should have just been Goblin's Blood, unless she modified it. So, oh, no, no, she had me pick the stuff out. Well, no, yeah, she'll have you pick the stuff out, and then she'll help you make it. Yeah. But it's, 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 um, it's a lesser version of Raven's Tears, is what Goblin's yeah. Blood is. Yeah. So. Okay, now, once again, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> It's, um, it's a, a a general I kill you bottle of death. Like it just yeah, pretty much. It's just meant to seek and destroy whatever it comes in contact with, and it's fucking awesome. And it will eat the face off of things. It's like acid. Um, so it's supposed to be used with discretion. I, on the other hand, if there's something that's bothering me, I'm equally prone to put it on my own hands while visualizing talons and all that stuff, cure it over a candle, and growl at it. And normally I get results. Cause it, it, nothing stays beyond that point. But, 
And then I spend about two days sick. <laughs> what? It's a nice little potion. I use it to ward my house. Uh, my little container's empty. 